good day, good night, all. Welcome back. Another special guest, and we're not across the pond. I've got someone a lot more local today, someone in the UK. Paul, please introduce yourself to the audience, and welcome to the broadcaster. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, so uh, my name is Paul Stobbs. Um, I run a YouTube channel called Understanding Conspiracy. And uh, I'm a bit of what you call a, a scattershot conspiracy theorist. I've kind of been in this game for maybe about just over a decade. I started the channel in 2014. Um, and I've kind of become, well, the guy known for popularizing a theory, well, creating a theory called uh, the Nephilim look like clowns. And uh, currently it's spreading far and wide and uh, the interest is kind of getting into it. And uh, most of my channel these days is is focused on spreading this idea, this um, this concept that the modern day clown is just a a purposefully invented symbol by secret societies to venerate demons, basically, in a nutshell. <laughs> and um, yeah, so uh, you know, there's um, that's me summed up. That's the elevator pitch right there. But I, I, like I said, I, I talk about anything and everything on the channel. Um, I'm I've done my research. I've been in the uh, the game for a while, you know, um, all the occult knowledge, all the symbolism, all that kind of thing is kind of down pat. Um, I like to get into the philosophical side of things. I like to veer off the path a little bit, you know, and uh, get speculative about a lot of stuff to do with the spirit realm, DMT, uh, just general philosophy. And uh, yeah, you know, I've, I've got a nice little community online. It's growing. It's, it's strong. And right now I'm doing the podcast circuit. So here I am. This is it. This is it. So how how are you finding the the quote unquote community of sorts? Because it can be a little cutthroat at times. Is everybody <laughs> welcoming you with open arms, kind of thing? Well, me, I've I've been like I said, I'm, this isn't my first rodeo. You know, I've been doing this for years, um, yeah. and I myself, you know, I've made many videos critiquing the truth of community in a way even though I'm a, I'm a member of it i see our flaws yeah. i see the characters that kind of yes. make us look bad and i try and i try and you know i have sections on my channel dedicated to basically trying to help people who, who are waking up for lack of a better term cope with it because unfortunately most people who start to learn the the harsh truths of reality that have been hidden from them they usually start going a bit crazy and it's not uncommon for them to then kind of uh go mouthing off to the family and friends trying to get them to wake up in kind of a, an erratic way you know and it ends up pushing people away and isolating them rather than waking other people up and um i, th I find a lot of people you know in the truth community do get hyper focused on certain topics as well and get a bit obsessive and all in all i just don't think any of that behavior is conducive to actually a healthy community that helps anybody so i try and point that out quite a lot whenever possible and i also try and give tips and advice on how to better deal with learning these things so you don't lose all your friends and family and you don't become an outcast and weird or alienated person who uh you know is, is detached from reality and no longer grounded so that, you know, I, I try to lead by example Yes. Um, in terms of the community reacting to my theory, there's always going to be those people who send me the worst, horrible, most vile messages in the world. And I, I've always had them. So it's it's war off my back, you know. Um, but no, the, I would say 99% of people who follow my work are very receptive and, and lovely, amazing people, like I said. And I have an amazing community of uh, uh, f people who help me every day, you know, with ideas and just support. And it's a, it's a great community. I can't lie that I've built and um, networked over the years. I have a telegram group that which people can join uh, by the name of understanding conspiracies about just shy of 300 people in there now. And mm. honestly, it's, it's an amazing conversation every day, people sharing their own experiences, their own journeys, you know, and I, I love, I love a good, uh, coming to the truth journey story i really do oh yes yes and i think i think that's where i think that's a good point to start in reference to your your starting journey in regards to la truth as the francais would say um <laughs> what was your what was the turning point where you started to stir a little bit in the beds and start to think mm, let, let me come out of this dream state what was that 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 point for you I know this sounds cliche, but I've, I've always kind of been a bit out, a bit of an outsider. Mm -hmm. um, I've never really not been observant. If that's the the good starting point for someone who's naturally going to wake up, I'm an artist by by nature. I've always drawn. I've always 
I've always been the quiet kid who just drew happily in the corner. I was every parent's dream. You know what I mean? And I, was, I, was always, I was always in my own imagination trying to make sense of the world at all times, you know, and I, I, I grew up as a child loving the beauty in nature and the intricacies of, of this, this amazing creation as I see it now, you know? Um, so I've always kind of been one as growing up to want to try and explore that deeper and to understand the, the nature of reality in all its facets, spiritually and physically, you know? So, you know, I grew up, I grew up rel- uh, relatively atheistic initially, maybe through, through um, a, just a lack of religious example or spiritual example. It okay. was never, it was never a thought originally, you know? Um, and I kind of developed kind of a um, a hatred, a typical edgy teenage hatred towards religion, thinking it's mm-hmm. in the world, you know, and, and, you know, trying to basically say anyone who believes in, in a sky daddy is an idiot type of attitude, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then as I got older into like, say, my late teens, um, I was kind of getting heavily into cannabis use. Okay. Uh, smoking every day, you know, eight joints a day for eight years, it ended up being um and basically going down the the, the route of being like a, a new age hippie i suppose you'd call it yes. conscious consciousness exploration um you know trying to trying to reach new dimensions through the use of psychedelics that type of world became my life you know and um also- and what it's well, Sorry, what inspired ahead. what inspired that paul what 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 led you down the psychedelic path it was it's hard to say because it I was so high that I kind of forgot most of my past. <laughs> but, but no, I mean, if if I really go far back, when I was sixteen, I, I had this. I had friends, you know, and we were always kind of questioning all things in reality. I'd always had these these really close to friends, um, whom we called ourselves the Brain Trust because we we would just literally spend every night in my in my brick shed smoking weed and just drinking wine and just talking you know yeah. and not about just not about just trivial nonsense about our yeah. own personal lives really getting into the hard trying to answer the hard questions about morality and 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 reality and what it means to be a person and with different personalities who interact with the world and what the right way to to be in the world is type of thing and it was kind of always just a logical next step to explore other realms if possible you know if that's true we need to test it are they actually there? You know, so it was kind of like a scientific method type thing, but we got our, hand, our hands on salvia. I, ah. was, I was only 16, maybe 17 at this time. You know, I was in college in my first year of like college type of thing, just fresh out of high school. And um, I did salvia because it's about at the time, you know, we're talking, we're talking about 15, but you know, 15 years ago now. Mm. I time flies. I forget I'm 31 now, you know, but <laughs> yeah, back in the time, Salvi, you could just get it over the counter in a head shop. You know what I mean? It wasn't, um, it's not illegal or anything. It was just there ready. You could just get it, you know, and it was cheap and it's more powerful than DMT. You know, I didn't even know this at the time, but mm-hmm. the most powerful psychedelic on the earth, like, and it was kind of one of those. So I was, we were hitting it hard, you know, we did our research and how to do it proper and we did it proper, you know, and we, we took the three hits and we held them in type of thing. And we, yeah. we just went with it and we just tried to see what would happen. And, um, I watched my friend do it first and he was laughing hysterically. He was telling me there was little people running across his hands and he was, it was just my, he could tell he, he was blown away by what he was witnessing. You know, this yeah. was a, and he was like the logistical, atheistic, scientific mind of us all, you know. And even, even he was like, well, what is this? I, I don't know what's going on, you know. I've always been more of the uh, the open-minded, artsy yeah. type person, you know. So I was more susceptible and probably to, to believe anything. <laughs> but um, he wasn't, you know. He, and even he was like, I don't know what that was. I don't know what I saw. All I know is it was real, you know. It's that kind of attitude. Mm-hmm. And then when I did it, you know, I, I actually had a really terrifying bad experience, Um we did record it at the time. <laughs> and uh, if I remember correctly, it's long gone now because obviously we got rid of all these things when people grew up and wanted to get into uh, jobs. You know, things like <laughs> that, you know? But, uh, but I, I do remember like, um, I basically just said no. And that's it. I'm gone. I'm silent for 10 minutes, just staring into the void, melted into the bed. You know what I mean? And I'm like he- breathing heavily, sweating profusely, kind of my body's convulsing back and forth. And I just go on a bad trip for like for what feels like an eternity, you know. And I remember basically going through a vortex into this other world. And 
and maybe it wasn't actually that scary in retrospect but for you know for a 16 17 year old yeah going, going to another dimension i was overwhelmed i couldn't I couldn't cope with that reality shattering experience, you know, and it, it, I was never the same afterwards, but um, it didn't discourage me. I went harder after that. My other friends didn't, I, I went off to university after this, you know, not long after I, I did salvia a couple more times and I just laughed like a hyena. Um, but it's like, it's a weird laughter because you can't stop. You try to stop. And because you can't stop, you panic, that, but you're still laughing. Mm. and it's not a laughter of joy it's a laughter of pain eventually because you can't stop laughing and you want to so hard that it it, it you say it, it border it borders wailing in pain rather than laughter Do you know oh, what I mean? wow. it, it kind of crosses that boundary and it's hard there's very little between fear and fear and laughter you find you know what i mean <laughs> when you're actually in that mode but um that's my second experience with it and i felt like i kind of felt like i was being possessed to be honest looking back that was a very bizarre experience you know did but, uh, you see the the prototypical little elves that people thought, talk about i saw a lot of things i saw life in everything including the wallpaper <laughs> you know it was mm. everything was alive everything was moving everything was yeah. in, a, in a sense um, a consciousness of sorts you know it was uh and I suppose in a way I did see life forms, if you could call it that, but they weren't anything akin to what you could consider something in the real world. You know, it was, okay. it's, it's, you're completely detached. It's, it's, it's beyond our language to explain. I think for me, yeah. you know, it's, yeah. um, you have to experience it kind of thing. Unfortunately, as horrible and, and mundane as that sounds. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'm not encouraging, anybody, I'm not encouraging anybody to go out and do these things now. You know, this is, this is a different time for me. You know, this was a different mm -hmm. worldview. Um, sorry, go ahead. I interrupted you there. No, no, no. It it makes perfect sense. And as you say, you were you were a young adolescent at the time, searching and 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 trying to find yourself and questions. Yeah. And you've got questions. You're trying to find the answers. So it makes sense that you're gonna grow and develop spiritually, emotionally, um, knowledge base wise based upon a 15 year time time um, gap. So no, it, it it makes total sense what you're saying. That's what I mean, yeah. So, so again, at, at this point, you know, I wasn't anywhere close to a conspiracy thinker. You know, I wasn't in that world. It was, I wasn't quote unquote awake, you know, what I mean? mm. if you want to call it anything or anything close, close to the Christian version of saved, you know, it's, um, I was, yeah, I was, I was a lost individual, you know, and I was quite, I'm not going to lie, you know, I, I don't like who I was then looking back, you know, I, I was, uh, I was big headed. I was egotistical. I was, um, no, I was cruel. And, In what respects? Um, I could enact revenge on people who did me wrong quite easily without any second thought. Things okay. like that. You yeah. know, I, I I didn't care about other people so mm. much in itself. Um, I suppose you could consider it more narcissistic in a sense or... Maybe all maybe all teenagers are narcissistic. They're thinking about it. I don't really know, but uh, <laughs> I don't I don't like who I was. I had a lot of enemies. Um, I was one of those personalities, and maybe I still am. I don't know, but um, you either like me or you really really hate me. It's one of the two, you know. And I rarely find people who are just passive or indifferent towards my character. I don't know why. I wish people would be more passive sometimes, but uh, it's either one of the two. Either they like me and they get on with me and they think I'm a nice guy, or they just hate me. And I kind of, I've always had that issue. Um, and it, I kind of learned this thing. I kind of realized after a while, you know, growing up, it's kind of, if everyone in the room is calling you a dickhead, you're probably a dickhead, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, had to do, I had to do a lot of retrospective thought, you know, and 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 growing basically. And, you know. That's brave though, Paul. That is very brave to to face, to, to, to not only be aware of the room you know when people say read the room but then to actually address it like shit maybe i'm a dickhead like, <laughs> well, well yeah well, what, well, what what parts of my personality do i need to tone down or uh, and then hype up other parts of my personality to balance this out because ultimately we're it's about balance it's about yeah. having the goods with a little bit of bads you know a little bit of pain with a little bit of with, with a little bit of joy you know we've got to balance these things out um, absolutely i mean I was a bit of a, I was a bit of a, what you call a player in a sense, <laughs> you know what I mean? And 
Um, I just I didn't care about who I hurt along the way as well. A lot of that stuff was going on, you know, and and maybe a lot of it was grown from some kind of feeling of inadequacy because I was butt bullied in high school for being a bit of a loser, a fat weirdo, you know. And then as I got older and better looking, and th- I was in the best shape of my life at that age, you know what I mean? It's kind of <laughs> it, things change, you know what I mean? And maybe it went all yeah. to my head. I don't know, but um, anyway, I went to university and it was quite a shocking change of of pace because suddenly I was a nobody, you know having to start again in a new city it's that kind of coming of age story you know and you've got to try and find yes. your place in it um so i think i learned a lot then you know and a lot a lot of um i had to do a lot of retrospective thinking then because um for a short period of time i had to be sober because i didn't have any connections to get the cannabis i was so heavily addicted <laughs> in the city, you know? and it's kind of had to kind of start again yeah and and you do start thinking again you know you're looking out the window while it's raining just you know and getting those deep thoughts type of thing. <laughs> but as, as time went on i very quickly fell back into who i originally was and i got in the same crowd you know i found the drug scene quite quickly and um as just, you do as yeah. a smoker you know another yeah. smoker you know so i made my connections quickly yeah you know what city um did you go to university wise uh lincoln Ah, Lincoln. Yeah, Good old yeah. Town. Very small town, markety kind of town. Oh, it is. It's very small, but uh, that, that's that's made things easy, you know. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> uh, you knew everybody, you know, very quickly. Yeah. Um, and either you're in that world or you're not in that world. And it's a dark world when you're in it, but when you're in it, you don't see it as being dark. You see it yeah. as being something colorful and wonderful and amazing and like a, a tight a tight close-knit community just like you know any community you can get involved with but uh you know i found my connections i got my cannabis and i also got into the uh the mdma scene as well there was a few cocaine connections knocking about as well i wasn't so heavy into that i was more into the consciousness stuff you know yeah. and i was looking for people who could get me the uh you know get me the the psychedelics the mushrooms the lsd the tabs you know yeah um and i got them i got them rapidly you know and I, I i got to a point where um i was microdosing quite a lot uh through my like my my first and second years even towards the end of the university as well i was studying fine art you know, right next to the cathedral funnily enough so that was an amazing mm-hmm. experience i can imagine especially tripping right next to that bloody cathedral <laughs> yeah the thing this is the thing i was never i was rarely actually in the studio um where all the other art students were busy at work because for me I, I'm, again, I'm not. I'm not trying to brag when I say this, but I never really felt like I had to work very hard in art to get where I wanted to be. Okay. Um, I've always kind of just breezed through high school and college, getting the top marks, and I never really felt like I did any work. Um, mm. and I I would watch other people staying after after class in extra hours to try and just barely scrape by, you know. And because I was good in it, and because I loved the work, it never felt like work, you know. Um, and I. I, I never really bothered going to many lectures or classes. I turned up to do enough that needed to be done, and I still left with a two one in the end. You know, that's spent, good. Yeah, I spent most of my time getting high and busy doing my own thing. And and this channel, funnily enough, was the end result of my entire university um thing. It was my my end of year project. Um, it was my final show because this is the thing, right? But as, as twenty twelve was coming around the end of the world talk was happening about, about, <laughs> yeah, you know, about the Mayan calendar. And this is the period I was at uni to 2011 to 2014. So this caught my attention, you know, as somebody who was already into the new age, uh, I don't know, sacred geometry stuff, you know what I mean? Okay. Uh, all the yeah. numerology stuff and all the, uh, seeing the, yeah. Yeah, all the, all, all of it, you know, as an artist, a lot of my artwork was, was basically using sacred geometry to make, flower of life mandala patterns all over the place and mm. i was kind of just digging that style at the time and that kind of that world you know and that fit that way of thinking so i was kind of become a, a heavy gnostic i was never much of a hippie because i've just never been like like that you know what I mean? yeah I, I actually worked at lush that was my first job you know lush the stuff yeah i know yeah, right. no, it looks yeah, very yeah, well yeah. that was my first job as a 16 year old i got fired for not being lushy enough uh, <laughs> so <laughs> After a couple of years. So basically, I didn't have dreadlocks. I wasn't hippie enough for their liking. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But, but, I was, but a lot of people assumed I was that kind of guy. So I, I didn't go down the new age crystal chakra power alignment stuff. I went more into the mystic occult Gnostic stuff. You know, um, I wanted to know, get to the deep roots and the esoteric understanding of things rather than the the 
how can this make my life better with reading the tarot cards type of thing? I wasn't into that, you know. Um, I wasn't interested in getting getting in touch with things like ascended masters or whatever oh. side or ancestor spirits. I, I was more about being as, as objective as possible, you know, about the situation and not trying to apply things to what I was seeing that could be could warp my perception of them. You know, I didn't want any preconceived ideas and. Yeah. So, like I said, I, there was a lot of things happening at this time in my life. You know, I was I was heavily, I was basically in the psychedelic realm twenty four seven. I was being sober was a trip. You know, yeah, I, yeah. I was always high from morning till I went to sleep. I was always smoking weed, which is a minor psychedelic. You know, and mm-hmm. it, it puts you in a state, in a place that isn't the reality that you should be in. It's not the reality everyone else is in. You know, it's kind of like mm-hmm. it, it makes waking life feel like you're in a dream, essentially. Yeah. And then then microdosing in between, you know, trying to explore different levels of, of piercing that veil or seeing the design within nature and, and everything through the geometry and making artwork about it. And I, I kind of had this thing in the background about this end of the world and stuff and it caught my attention. I ended up watching loads of videos about predictions about what's going to happen in 2012, you know. Wow. Um, people were saying all sorts of things like the pole magnetic poles are gonna shift. Yes. Um the we're, poles we're, are <laughs> Yeah, you know, Wormwood's going to return or something like that. Or Nibiru is going to come back into our solar system. Yeah. And then there was the New Age saying things like, no, 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 we're all going to ascend to the next level of the fifth dimension of consciousness, you know, and and it's everyone had their own spin on it, you know. And then you had the Christian angle saying, now it's the rapture, it's 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 the end, you know, it's the end of the world, it's revelation is going to begin. The 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 beast from the bottomless pits is about to release, you know, Abaddon in Revelations, and everyone had an idea. Everyone yeah. had a perspective, and it was all their own culturally, ideologically unique way of of, of anticipating the end of whatever that's going to be. You know, new and strands this... of DNA being formed onto the. Oh um... yeah, yeah, yeah. And you remember? You were there clearly. You, I mean, I noticed. I noticed your logo is the uh, anonymous mask. So you must have been around for a while. If you saw your logo. <laughs> I I I um started staring around two thousand and two. So I've got a, a little, little bit of more, more time on you, but yeah, you, your yeah. your journey sounds quite similar, quite similar of sorts. I mean, I was one, I was wearing the anonymous mask at the time, you know, I was, I was in that kind of crew in a way, mm. um, but it, but I was also wearing it, thinking, what's the danger of wearing a mask? Realistically, what's that mean? You know, because when people become anonymous, they don't act like themselves, and I was kind of being reflective about that idea and critique. Yeah. And when some of my early videos, I critiqued the whole movement, and I'm like, "Anonymous, just take off the mask." I don't think it's actually helping anybody. I did, I did a performance piece at uni where I basically, um, I was holding a sign, well, signs that I flick through, which were basically all the predictions for the end of the world. So Nibiru is going to come back, or I was just, just each sign had something different on it. But I was yeah. still wearing the anonymous mask while doing it, and I, I noticed people weren't receptive to me at all. And my observations taught me they were actually scared of the mask. Mm. They were scared of the mask. They didn't care about what was on the board or what I was doing. I was just stood there. It's something about the mask that made people look at me in the face and cringe or like kind of look concerned or weird. Some like a lot of people actually look scared. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it made me think about this mask. Like, that's weird. You know, uh, is it really useful as a tool? Mm. Probably not. You know, I don't think it really helps get to anybody. I think it pushes them away. You know, and that was like. One of my first kind of major critiques of the truth movement at the time, you know, I mean, now I look back on anonymous, and I don't really consider it um, useful in any way, shape or form. So was, <laughs> I think it was a bit of a, a bit of a, a misleading psyop. psyop in a way, yeah, you know, mm. um, and I think there's been plenty of those type of movements since, you know, with other names. Um, but I was there, you know, I was, I was at that level by that time of conspiracy. It was all about the 1%. It was about monetary corruption. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was all about, worldly stuff earthly basic stuff and Mm -hmm. i wasn't kind of in any way spiritual about the conspiracy stuff but i was obviously exploring my own spirituality around this time and and i I went on a journey just to find out why people were thinking the world was going to end and my my ethos was going to be something like well i'll just become the conspiracy theorist you know and i will believe everything i find and just roll with it you know like a method acting type way and I'll just roll with it. I'll just take everything to its logical conclusion. I'm not going to question anything. Each theory, I'm going to just go, go right yeah. to the end of it. Everything, you know, let's go to the 
full conclusion of this theory and where it leads to, you know, if you're going to take it as real and it's like, how does that make you become doing that as well is what my ethos was going to be. I was very psychoanalytical about what it meant to be a conspiracy theorist at the start. Yeah. Which is why my channel is called Understanding Conspiracy. And it's also why my logo is heavily seeped in this sacred geometry symbolism, you know? Um, and it's also, there was a lot of stuff there about the symbolism you find generically in conspiracy, like the Venus, Saturn, Mars, sacred yes. geometry, star of Remphan, um, sun worship. It's all kind of melded into my logo. Um, and it's it's a product of that time of my journey. And so uh, yeah, time went on and I basically started to slowly realize there's actually a lot of truth in all of this, all of these theories and ideas. There really is a huge corruption type of going on. You know, there's, there's some yeah. agenda play here and there's some nefarious actors who are pushing agendas towards something called a new world order. And it was all kind of, this, yeah. isn't, this isn't just crazy people making stuff up even though most people who try and share this information sound like crazy people making stuff up. And that's kind of what was my issue. You know, it's I'm like, I eventually got to the conclusion that this is the right information. It's just in the wrong hands. Mm. Um, and it's, it's sad. I, I felt so much empathy and, and for, for the movement, you know what I mean? Cause it's like, you, I agree with everything, but I don't agree with the style of how this particular person, let's say is trying to tell people it's not going to work, you know? You're just going to push people away. And it's kind of, I'd always had a sales background in terms of jobs. You know, I'm a cold caller at call centers. I knew how to kind of convince people to buy things they didn't really need, you know. And I picked up a thing or two in NLP and I understood, you know, people don't buy products. They don't care about the actual product itself. It's all about whether or not they trust the person selling them the product. Exactly. People buy people. People buy people, absolutely, you know, and and it's kind of been one of my mantras on my channel for a while, and one of the main reasons why I try and tell people to cal just calm the fuck down. Mm. <laughs> you know, if you're going to try and convince anybody of this stuff, you need to, you need to be chilled. <laughs> you know, yeah. you need to, you need to come across in a way that's calm and collected and cool because that person you're trying to convince doesn't want to end up like you if you look crazy. And how does how do they avoid that? Well, they don't listen to the information you tell them. They don't believe yeah. it. If I yeah. don't leave this stuff, I won't end up like this crazy person in front of me, you know, and that's how it works. And I wish it wasn't, you know? I wish it was easier, but that's kind of the, that's kind of the deal. That's the yeah. hand we've been dealt, you know, it's hard. So, it, it's so yeah. difficult to try when you find, when you quote unquote, wake up and you discover that you might, as you say, th there is actually an agenda and you start to do your research and then you think, okay, you start looking into maybe the dairy industry and, and, and you know, um, the industrialization of farming and you think, oh my God, I, I had no idea they were doing this stuff to the animals. And then you think to yourself, well, what change can I make myself personally? And you think, okay, well, maybe, you know, lactose from a cow, you know, humans are the only ones who seem to want to, drink cows pus you know <laughs> after being an adult and stuff you know i mean after being a child and stuff hmm what's the reasoning behind that why have they been marketing us to have drink cow pus like and why are we why are they injecting the cows with all this stuff so then again you start to make decisions and um question your your own how can you make an effect on this industry can i start myself and then you've got so much energy and you've got so much zeal that you found out that, look, actually, drinking milk isn't that healthy. You can actually get a lot of calcium from vegetables and all the rest of the stuff. You start to tell other people and you've got you are oh, because I, I'm more healthy now. I can see I have less mucus. I'm, I'm less tired. My, my joints are a bit better now. I'm not drinking this stuff. And you want to tell the world. You want to tell everybody so they can potentially make an impact in their life. And that's where the issue happens when you've yeah. got all of this energy and all of this, like, I want to make the whole world. I want to start with my mom. I'm going to start with my dad, then my sisters, my brother, my friends. I'm going to tell everyone. Whereas as you say, chill. Yeah. Let's, <laughs> let, let's, let's start with you first. You learn all these tools, these tricks, these ideas, you master self. And then maybe you can be the beacon of light where your, where your mom will say, Paul, I've noticed you, your skin's looking a lot better and you're glowing and you've got all of this energy. What have you been doing? 
Oh, you know, I've been juicing. You remember I told you I've got that nutrient injury and stuff now? Oh, yeah, you know. And by example, and just by maybe just dropping a little bit of a little gem here, a little gem there, people will come, <laughs> build it, and they will come, right? Well, you've, yeah, you've got to be the change you want to see in the world. And it's also, you know, make sure your own house is in order before you go and try and save the world type of situation. It's classic, classic advice for anybody. But we, you forget that when you're in this stuff, you very quickly... Because, because you kind of your whole paradigm, your whole the the structure you built your entire worldview on has kind of collapsed. So you, you're going to be in a bit of a frenzy, and I, that's why I empathise with these people so much. But yeah, again, it, you know, you need to take a step back before you start thinking about how other people are going to receive this information. And I think that's a, that's kind of a, a thought process that's often missed by a lot of truthers. They don't consider the the consequences of telling the truth because this world is is unfortunately you know, the liars are kind of in control and a lot of people benefit from the lies so the truth is a weapon and uh people don't necessarily appreciate it when you start like waving a gun in the face um and that's the kind of what you're doing you know what i mean you're uh you're threatening their preconceived uh world and ideas and ideologies and it's that's that's not actually going to be as well received as you think it is. You've kind of got to give little hints in a way and lead people to to the the water, and it's up to them if they want to drink at the end of the day. That's you can't you can't force anybody, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get what you're saying. Perfect in, analogy. Yeah, in terms of in terms of this this story, I'll try and sum up my backstory. Maybe we can get on to some other stuff after that. But uh, you know. I, the channel started rolling after university. I, I kind of, I was a bit lost. I didn't know who I was or what I was going to do with my life after university. You know, I had to come back home to Preston in the Northwest where I went, you know, and kind of start again, again, you know, and mm. I kind of, um, you know, I had with a more tools, but you've yeah. got more tools and you're tool back now to start again. Kind of, you know, I, I kind of just fell into getting a job as a manager of a, well, I was a, I was a store assistant at Aldi, funnily enough. And, um, I kind of just started again and, and, but I, well, let's, let's rewind a bit. So just before I left uni is when I kind of started to lean towards becoming more of a Christian thinker. Um, I'd been seeped in the occult for so long and I've been exploring these other realms for so long that I kind of, um, I, I'd burned myself out and I got nowhere. I had no answers. I didn't know any more than I did prior and I was kind of disillusioned with the new age stuff and the Gnostic thinking. I realized it's all kind of just nonsense. It's all just there to kind of keep me suppressed in a way. It's, it's bad, zero positive fruit in my life at all. It's only made me spiral further and further into depression and, and pain and misery and death. I was, I was probably dying from the heavy amounts of MDMA I'd been doing for three years, you know what I mean? And, and the rest of it. And, and my my receptors were frazzled, you know, I, I had nothing left. I couldn't think or feel like a human being anymore. And it was kind of, I was heavily addicted to cannabis and, and the rest. And, you know, all the alcohol that must have done some damage to me as well in those years. And <laughs> I was kind of at a low point. I was at a low point in like 2014. And um, again, with no direction. And I kind of, I'd been researching about the Christian angle to all of this stuff, all the truth of stuff, you know, and I yeah. never really, I'd, I'd been dipping my toes into it, you know, and I, by this point I wasn't fully like, you know, I've been listening to certain preachers and people to, telling me what Christianity is and trying to get a good idea and understanding of this worldview. And I kept noticing that most of the conspiracy rabbit holes I went down, they always end up hitting the bottom and the bottom foundation was always Jesus is real and so is God and you need to stop paying attention to it, you know, but I would always just keep bouncing back away from that and going down another rabbit hole and yeah. never wanting to kind of go down that one, you know, that big, that big gaping like, yeah. void, void of truth. I didn't, I just didn't want to do it, you know. Um, I was happy with my delusions of believing I was a God, just experiencing um, reality through a vessel, which is an aspect of everybody else is a God as well. And we're all just doing the same thing, forgetting that word God, very Zen Buddhist kind of idea. Oh, on, on that note, before you continue, go, go. You, see, you see with that, it, it says, and I'm pretty sure you're aware of this, it says, ye are all gods, little g, children of the most high. And then people take just that one um, scripture, not the full scripture, because at the end it, it says, and ye will die like men. 
Yeah. So they won't they won't put the two together because of course we are physical representations of the most high on this plane of existence. So that so the so the statement is true, but the way it's backed up is is <laughs> you know, we've got a little bit of doubt there, like, oh I'm the I'm the creator. So I can physically manifest just like the most high created the, the planet. So I can create planets, moons, stars, I can do anything because I can create. No. Yeah. No. Well, it just for more context to that verse, I believe the sons of God that they were referring to were the angels who had um, rebelled. And it's those who were gods. And now they will die like men. Um, so it wasn't even talking about human beings. Uh, <laughs> you know, we're not gods. And um, to be honest, we were made in the image of God. That yeah. much is true. And we, we, we messed it up. <laughs> That's basically what happened. And now, yeah. we're, and now we're some kind of corrupted we're far removed from from the glory we originally had in Eden, you know, and that's the whole point of needing a savior, basically. Um, but that that passage that was used to say, you know, you you're all gods, and it's kind of well, they weren't, they weren't even talking about people. This and this is the kind of level of naivety people had in that new age thinking that I even even I had about biblical knowledge. It was kind of a superficial understanding of the verse, but it was even then it was based in utter ignorance with no context, you know. Yeah. And, and that, that was enough for me at the time, because, again, I was happy believing that I was a god in a way, you know. And this is, again, a part of this. I don't like who I was at this time I was talking about earlier, you know. And it just comes with that natural narcissism that comes with that way of thinking, you know. Um, and, again, it was bearing me no fruits. It was not good for me. And, and like I said, I was at rock bottom after uni, and I basically asked God for help. I was like, if you're real, please save me I, I don't think, I think I'm going to die soon. You know, I don't think I'm doing well here. Um, and he did. Um, I I was taking a bath at the time at a hotel in Newcastle for a stag do for my brother-in-law. And um, I hadn't had a bath in years. I'd only ever had showers um, yeah. because we only ever lived in a place with a shower cubicle. And I inadvertently baptized myself because as soon as I asked for help and put myself under the water, I had to shoot out of the bath because just energy went through my body and into my heart, into my chest that just animated me. I had to get up, you know, and it left as soon as it came. It wasn't invasive in a way. It felt warm, you know, mm -hmm. but it was, it was shocking because I didn't see that coming, you know, but since that day in 2014, I think it was March, I've never really been the same. Um, I haven't touched a psychedelic since I haven't, um, well, slowly I've been losing all my addiction since then. Um, I quit cannabis in 2016, cold Turkey. Congratulations. Uh, I haven't touched it since. Um, I switched to an e-cigarette around the same time and I've been lowering the nicotine levels in that ever since. And it's taken me that long to quit at the start of this year in January. And I haven't touched it since. Outside uh, of the physical addiction, is it more of the ritual slash routine of smoking? What's the hardest thing to stop? It was feeling like I needed a crutch. I needed something because this world is so hard. It's letting go of that idea that um, I don't need a crutch. Mm. It was hard. It's it's who am I? Who am I without the cigarette? It's that kind of thought as well. Yeah, a lot of people's identities get built around addictions. Who am I if I'm not the stoner guy? You know, yeah. um, who am I if I'm not the fun guy with a drink in his hand all the time? Mm. You know, it, that, that's what most addictions I find are based on. It's an, it's a pride situation as well, as well as just um, obviously self-medicating to deal with trauma as well. I think a lot of that was what mine was based upon. Um, fear, you know, fear of not having something to lean on. But I, I put all my faith in God and, and I lent on him and he's done nothing but help me become a better person ever since and, and free of these addictions so you know it's not that's not very convincing to somebody who's not a christian i know it's not convincing evidence that they exist but uh, for me personally i've seen real tangible results by by focusing my attentions onto this true form of spirituality not just these vain philosophies that come out of the new age yeah. um, i'm actually seeing results you know and and it's not just that i, I being born again is a serious thing. You, you are, you, your old self literally dies. I, I understand that now. And I wasn't the same person after that moment. And it's kind of like everything I once loved and wanted to do, I hated suddenly. I didn't want to do it anymore. You know, it's like you, I became a person who didn't see the joy or pleasure in those things anymore. Yes. You know, somehow, you know, suddenly it was disgust rather than joy at the thought of doing them. Mm. Uh, the conviction came on me every time I smoked a cigarette. I was, it was always, why am I doing this? Yeah. 
you know in the past it was like oh well what's the harm you know whatever you only live once but suddenly it wasn't that anymore nothing was like that i couldn't just do something that would be considered a sin anymore without actually yeah. feeling convicted about it and you know like i said i didn't change overnight i don't I think a lot of people think you know being born again or coming to a christian faith means you have to be perfect instantly and it's not that's just that's a very church anity mainstream way of seeing it it's it's a personal relationship and a journey exactly know? and it's also impossible to be perfect how yeah, can well, a human being be perfect on this this plane of existence well I, you can't that's why you need a savior that's why you need christ to intercede on your behalf for, with god you know because you're not perfect and you never will be and god gets that you know yeah. and, uh, there's a lot of uh, you know zealots out there and people out there who will tell you you know you have to follow the rules perfectly or else and it's kind of yes and no try your best is basically the mantra you know do the hardest yes. you know you, you know when you're falling short you know mm. when you're not being who you should be or when you're you're failing you know it you know and try not to try your hardest and you know when you're not trying your hardest you know you know you know when you're not living up to your full potential and it's yeah. kind of you you kind of learn you know as you grow in in your faith and go on your journey with god that he kind of has a life planned out for you which is your life that you would want yes you know? and it's he's not forcing you to take it but it's there if you take the leap of faith and just go for it you know and a lot of people are scared and trapped in their own, I've got to pay the bills, I've got to have this job, I can't go and do whatever I want because of this type of thing, you know. And and it's kind of it's scary to 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 take that leap. But I found if you just do, if you if you yeah. put in ten percent of the effort, he'll carry you the rest of the way. Of you know? course, yeah. Kind of what I'm that's kind of what I'm learning as 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 you know, my own journey with faith is going, you know. Mm-hmm. It's kind of you know, I was scared to give up cannabis. But I did. I just did. I just stopped it, and I could I could feel his support throughout the whole thing. You know, um, it, it's. I mean, my life is ten times better than what it was before before this. You know, since then, you know, I I worked at Aldi. I became a manager. I got a lot of money behind me because mm. it pays well. But I also got the experience of of managing people, which it is. Is which will stick with me for the rest of my life. And it prepared yeah. me in a way to be a kind of a leader, you know, in a way. I'm not saying that I am a leader or follow me or anything, but it gave me that ability to understand, you know, how to talk to people and, and yeah. understand that people have different needs and requirements. As a, And a good leader isn't somebody who bosses somebody around. It's somebody who is an example for others to to look up to and want, want to follow, you know, and, yes. and help and type of thing. And, understanding needs understanding their strengths yeah, yeah. and putting them in the right places and stuff but yeah i feel like god put me there to learn that because mm-hmm. um at the time i had the channel for a little while and um, i started in 2014 but in 2017 i had to stop because work found the channel i'd just been promoted by this point and they kind of said to me look you can't have this channel and be how on earth did they find the channel <sighs> Because it was no secret when I worked at an old store as a store assistant. It didn't matter then. I was just a lowly store assistant. They didn't care. Uh, um, but when I went to a new store as a manager, um, no one knew me. They didn't know anything about the channel. So I didn't tell them about it because I thought it's probably best they don't know. Yeah. Uh, but then someone from my old store came to work there for a day and just told oh. everyone. <laughs> and so that was it. The uh, cat was out of the bag. And then I, I came in one day and I just I just knew something was wrong. Mm. Uh, and then my manager pulls me in there with my area manager and they're all like uh, yeah paul you can't have this channel and and a youtube and be a manager you can't do it um you you talk about too much controversial stuff this is a multicultural diverse company you know and if they hear the kind of things you're talking about um and they complain we're not going to be able to protect you is what they said wow. basically we're not going to be on your side you know mm. So to protect you now we're te- we're advising you get rid of that channel if not then we're going to have to demote you um, and I was in no position at this point in my life to sit to to argue. I needed the money. I was in debt, you know, from university credit card debt and all that sort of type of thing. I just got this manager position. And I knew I needed the experience just to set me up for life, basically. Mm. Um, so I capitulated in a moment of weakness that I'm not very proud of, and I did. I stopped the channel. I removed all my videos. I and you know, in re- in hindsight, you know, I I was 17 episodes into my clown series by this point, and I had to stop. You know, and I, for five years, I just stayed away from conspiracy. All my videos were private. Everything was gone. And I just 
lived a normal life, I suppose, back in back into it, but as you know, obviously with my own Christian belief and perspective. Indeed. But yeah. in that in that time, you know, I, I do feel like actually it was probably good for me because I was becoming a very angry person with the state of the world at the time. This was during a time when uh, minor attracted persons were about. Oh trying. gosh, I know uh, exactly the period you're talking about. Uh, yes, you know, a Salon released an article trying to ver- talk about virtuous children, yeah. members, you know, and I couldn't. <laughs> I just yeah. couldn't deal with it. I was getting very angry, you know what I mean? And I was making pretty loud, shouting, swearing videos about the situation, you know? And um, maybe that's what contributed to my downfall in the end. Maybe that's some of the videos they saw, I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that comes with commenting on other particular groups of people, a part of maybe like what I like to call the multicolored collective, you know, who are yes. kind of a protected class these days, you know? The and big I- gang. Yeah, and I think that's where the whole, Paul, this is a multicultural, diverse company, you know, you can't be talking about this. Mm-hmm. Stuff. I think that's where all that kind of came from. Um, but yeah, you know, I think maybe look in hindsight, I needed that break just to get some perspective and become grounded again. Yes. In the real world, I've been swimming in the occult and conspiracy and Christianity and really out. I've been floating in space for so long. I forgot what it was like to be right here on the ground with real people, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I had to come straight crashing back down and 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 live that life, you know. And I kind of just shut myself off from it all for a long time, and and just focused on work, bettering myself, you know, and going to the gym. Um, you know, I I met, I met my beautiful wife, and we're now married. Um, I have an amazing son who's about to turn two. Congratulations! Um, you know, and like I said, I've been losing these addictions and everything, and and just focusing on getting my own house in order, basically. Um, but then, and then, um, someone picked up my channel, my series called Conspiracy R Us. He picked up my information. He was a regular commenter back in the day, um, and he started basically telling people about my theory, saying, "There's this theory I heard years ago on this channel that isn't around anymore." I'm talking about my channel, and he repopularized the Nephilim look like clowns concept. Mm-hmm. And I kind of felt emboldened by this point to re-release all the videos and stop them from being private. Yeah. Um, because obviously, you know, the people wanted to know about it. And I was kind of amazed that while people are actually responding to my theory, you know, yeah, that you like the work. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll show them my work. You know, here it is. And I gained a big influx of subscribers then, but I wasn't around making videos. I was still hidden, you know, yes. and I wasn't allowed to make them. And, you know, I watched the resurgence of my channel and I kind of had this calling, this feeling like I need to come back. You yeah. know, I don't, this is, I kind of I eventually realized, you know, I'm, I'm sick of pretending to be a manager of a supermarket. I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a conspiracy theorist. That's yeah. What I, you know, that's what I am. I'm an artist. I'm a creative person. I'm a thinker. Yeah. Um, you know, I, a critical I, thinker, most importantly, sir. Exactly. You know, I, and it's like, I don't belong here managing people stacking shelves. This is not my, this is not my life, you know? Yeah. This is not the life God wants me to have. I know it's not. And things started to happen that were pushing me out of the company. Um, I'd always been going for the next step up to become the store manager. And Mm -hmm. they always kept pushing me back or putting me in situations that would make me, you know, it's a competitive cutthroat world. Okay. And there there are people who are willing to step on you to get on top in that world. And I ended up getting sent to another store to try and train me to be, um, you know, the next step type of thing. And the new manager instantly said, I was shit at the job and I'll never be promoted. I had, and this is some, this comes off to, after running one shift um, after being off for three weeks with COVID and knowing no staff or anything about the store and how it operates. Mm-hmm. She judged my performance off of that and then shot down my chances. And I was like, okay, so I'm in for a bad run working under you then, you know, I could yeah. tell straight away. And it turns out she was just a raging sexist who only wanted women to be promoted. Um, And literally I was warned from the start by other male managers there saying she does not like men. She does not like men. Oh. Like I, are you saying like I myself had some serious issues being here with her? You're in for it, you know? Um, and I, I was like, nah, I'll be right. I'll get it to like me. Yeah. You know, I'm, you know yeah. so I'll figure it out, you know. And and it turns out, no, that's not what happened. I got accused of theft, even though I didn't commit any theft. And I got suspended under her watch. And she handled the whole thing proper creepily and weird. And um, 
this is when my wife was was in a third trimester as well. So the stress this put under I our family. I can imagine. It's ridiculous. You know, I was about to lose my job and have a baby. And anyway, I proved unequivocally outright through the risk. I had the receipts, you know, and the camera footage that she's full of it. And she's lied. And that's just not true. And it, the, whole, the whole thing got dropped. Okay. And she suffered no consequences for it. But I never forgot, you know. And I ended up going just back to like, I ended up going back to my old store because I just couldn't work with this woman anymore. And and it was just one thing after another thing. Like I was always being like led along saying, yeah, you can be a manager. Everyone always kept telling me, Paul, you're one of the best managers we've ever had. Everyone would tell me that, you know, yeah. and they would never promote me. And it's kind of like, why? You know, mm-hmm. and then they would, then they hired outside people to take the role instead from other oh, companies. Gosh. And I had to, I had to train them. And, train them. You know. and, it's, <laughs> and it's one insult after another, you know what I mean? It was just one yeah. insult after another. And then, then one night I got, um, called to deal with a, uh, a customer at the till who was being uh, basically being a bitch because she wasn't getting served alcohol because she didn't have ID for her two children who mm-hmm. looked close to 18 but weren't, you know what I mean? And um, I said, look, they've refused the sale. It's their license. It's my license, you know, and it's their right to refuse sales. I'm sticking with my staff on this one. I said, I'm not going to serve you. I'm sorry. Um, you know, go to Tesco around the corner. I don't care. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, then she started screaming in my face eventually i was i was cool and calm for uh, trying to explain the same thing over and over again and then she screamed and swore right right in my face you know and threatened me and i just said get out get just get out now you know yeah. not in my store i don't care you're banned you're barred do not come back and um then she hung around outside then she got her daughters to take photos of me through the window while i was serving customers at the till what and then next thing I know, an hour later, I get called down to the till again, uh, saying, Paul, someone here wants to see you. I get to the till and then someone taps my shoulder and says, are you Paul? I said, yeah. And then he grabs me around the throat and basically starts pushing me across the store screaming, if you, you know, if you talk to my fucking wife like that again, I'll kill you all this sort of thing. Um, customers <laughs> rip him off me, you know, and I, and I said, just you get out of here right now, you know, and then I just call the police and go through the whole process. Um, and after that day, you know, I was kind of like sick of it. I was like, what yeah. the hell am I doing in this, this company yeah. does not care about me in the slightest, you know what I mean? And the police did nothing to help me either. The company gave me no compensation. Um, even though I know they give way less for people slipping on grapes, you know what I mean? Indeed. And it's kind of like, I had nothing from this company, but no mis- support, misery and pain from the start. And it's kind of like, I felt like. Now I look back in hindsight, God was pushing me to get mm. get out, is what he was trying to say, improving to yeah. you again. Last year, you almost got sacked for something you didn't do. Now you're yeah. being strangled. You do not mm. belong here. Leave. You know? yeah. And me and my wife just, just basically said to each other, what are we? She worked for Aldi as well at the time. And she was also going through her own nightmare, absolute nightmare through some apprenticeship scheme that came to nothing, you know? And uh, it was, <sighs> we just looked at each other and we're like, we're both creative people. Yeah. Why, why don't we just start our own business? Let's just go for it. We're never going to do it otherwise. And we did. We just did. We just quit our jobs. And we started our own photography company, a wedding photography company, family photography. And it's been growing steadily, you know. Excellent. We've, we've done like five weddings in the year and other things in between, family shoots, pet photography, headshots, and and commercial mm. photography. And, you know, it's, it's early days. It's only six months old, but five yeah. weddings you know what i mean we're doing all right it's growing Definitely. and we're just trying to build that profile and it gave me the freedom as well to come back to youtube mm-hmm. and you know 